Oh, we're so glad you're joining us. For 3ABN Sabbath School panel, we are studying lesson five of our adult Bible study guide, which is the three cosmic messages found in Revelation 14, six through 12. Today, we are looking at the good news of the judgment. Did you know there was good news about the judgment? Right. I'm Shelley Quinn. Let me introduce your 3ABN family who is sitting at the table. Ryan Day, we're glad you're here. It's always a blessing to be a part of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. And I have Monday's lesson entitled, God's Mercy and Judgment. And Brother John Denzi. It's a blessing to be here. This is another powerful lesson. Oh. I have Tuesday, a magnificent scene. It's going to be wonderful. Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled, A Glimpse of Heaven. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. And my sister in Christ, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. I have Thursday, Jesus is Worthy. You know, each one of these lessons have been incredible. Yes. And Ryan, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to ask God's blessing on our discussion today. Absolutely. Father in heaven, as we take a trip into your throne room, as we uh, try to understand this judgment topic, Lord, we dare not uh, take upon this subject uh, on our own merits or upon our own ideas or thoughts. Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be poured out right now yeah. on each and every one of us that we approach this humbly with accuracy according to your word and according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We turn this time over to you and we ask this in Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, amen. The good news of judgment. Let's begin with Revelation 14, 7. I know we covered this in our last lesson, but we're going to take today, we're going to explore the deeper themes of the judgment. So Revelation 14, 7, the first angel who has already announced the gospel to be taken around the world, says with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory mm -hmm. to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So as we look at judgment in relation to the great controversy and everything that's going on and raging in the universe, we know that there is an inevitable judgment to come. You know, Paul in Acts 24, 25, he, he was talking with Felix and reasoning about God's love and righteousness and the judgment to come. What Felix do? Oh, well, go away. I'll think about this and maybe come back to it in a later day. But here's what I just wanted to impress again. And I know we're saying this every time because it is so true. God's nature is unselfish love. It is centered on others, his love. He operates not by the power of control, but by the power of love. That is how his government operates. And you know what? He established boundaries for human behavior. What parent loves a child and doesn't establish good, healthy mm. boundaries. Right. So what God did with his law, his 10 commandments, which I think of his, as his charter of rights for his government of love, he put boundaries mm -hmm. that protects our relationship with him and gives him the due that is, is, is uh, due him, the due that's due him. <laughs> <laughs> and he put these boundaries around our behavior so it would protect the rights of all humans. To ignore his boundaries is to act lawless, as if he has no law. And 1 John 3, 4 said, sin is lawlessness. Mm -hmm. So God is just. What does that mean when we say God is just? We know he's, he's love. We know he's light and righteous. But what does it mean to be just? It means to be absolutely good, to be fair-minded, virtuous, impartial, honest, incorruptible, 
trustworthy and righteous. God is a God of justice. He is consistent in the Old Testament and the New. And that might surprise you if you've never, sometimes people read his warnings in the Old Testament and think, ooh, God was being so harsh. No, he was, he's always been a God of judgment because justice requires judgment. Ecclesiastes 12.4 says God is going to bring every work into judgment, mm-hmm. including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Paul says in Romans 14, 12, each one of us, he says, shall give an account of himself to God. Justice requires judgment. And what is judgment? It is a legal transaction that demands our Heavenly Father is either going to levy one of two possible verdicts. To go into judgment means first, there's two ways that this can turn out. One, you can be condemned. An accused person that's found guilty, God declares them guilty and worthy of punishment. Or the much preferable Mm -hmm. way (laughs) is to be justified. And that is a legal transaction where God looks at us and by righteousness, the, through righteousness by faith in Christ Jesus, he pronounces an acquittal of the charges because he sees no forensic evidence that when we are in Christ, it, it blots out that record of our sins and he makes the official declaration that we're innocent. In 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, Paul tells, he's writing to Timothy, and he says, God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then we see God's words in Ezekiel 33, 11. And God says, as I live, mm-hmm. says the Lord's God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked, that the wicked would turn from his way, turn, repent, be converted, mm-hmm and live, turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? Mm -hmm. You know, God in Christ sacrificed himself to pay sin's penalty. He became, he suffered and he died. Why? To uphold the righteous law of God. If God was going to do away with his charter of rights, with his 10 commandments, then Christ died in vain. That's right. So he became our substitute because we're guilty of breaking the law. He was sinless and he makes it possible as Paul writes in Romans 3, 26, that God can remain just because he came down and showed it can be done but he's also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God's love and his holiness demand justice. We all want justice Mm -hmm. when a wrong is done, don't we? God's love demands mercy and grace. And someone has said this clever quote, I love it, justice, is receiving what we deserve. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve, but grace is receiving what we absolutely don't deserve. None of us deserve God's grace, but I am so glad that he is a God of grace. When we are in Christ, the good news of the judgment is that we don't have to fear the judgment. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7 and t- verse 22. Daniel 7, 22. Boy, I've got to hurry. Until the Ancient of Days came, he's watching, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints most high and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. What is the significance 
of the Judgment Hour, Sunday's lesson. I'm going to read what Mark Finley wrote. The Bible's last book, Revelation, focuses on the culmination of the age-long controversy between good and evil. Lucifer, a rebel angel, challenged the justice, fairness, and wisdom of God. He claimed that God was unfair and unjust in a way that he administered the universe. And Revelation's final judgment is at the very center of this conflict over the character of God. So let's return. We're going to reread the first angel's message, Revelation 14, 6 through 7. John is in vision. He says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. So the everlasting gospel is the foundation. Righteousness by faith is the foundation of the three angels' message. And then he says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. We're living in the judgment hour right now. He says, worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Do you realize the everlasting gospel and judgment are inseparable? They're intertwined. And that's good news for us because if you're in Christ, judgment reveals God's grace, his mercy, and his justice. It reveals his power to deliver, and it speaks of his moral code of love, the Ten Commandments. Mark Finley said, In the great controversy between good and evil in the universe, God answered Satan's charges on the cross. But in the judgment, he reveals that he has done everything possible to save us and lead us to the cross. I want to read what David wrote. This is his Psalm of Repentance, Psalm 51, 1 through 4. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. When you confess your sin as David did, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Amen. Judgment simply reveals if we've responded to God's love and the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Mm, amen. Very well put. Thank you, Shelley, so much for that. My name is Ryan Day, and I have Monday's lesson entitled God's Mercy and Judgment. And uh, as always, Pastor Mark Finley, in his uh, beautiful gift of being able to, to write and express the gospel so clearly, he mm. writes in the lesson, he says, The cross and judgment both reveal that God is just and merciful. The broken law demands the death of the sinner. Justice declares the wages of sin is death. Mercy responds the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, 23. If God's law could be changed or abolished, and this was the point Shelley had made earlier, if God's law could be changed or abolished, it would be totally unnecessary for Jesus to die. Christ's death establishes the eternal nature of the law, and the law is the basis of judgment. And, you know, many people have questioned that before. You know, how, who, what are we judged by? The Bible makes it very clear in Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. The Bible says here, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many have, as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. So, yes, we are indeed judged by the law. But the lesson brings out and asks us, but how are we judged? And by what are we judged? Obviously, uh, it takes it a little step further and bringing us to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 where obviously we're seeing those final scenes taking place there uh, at the end of the 1,000 years when it's all said and done and this old world is beginning to pass away on the brink of God creating a new heaven and a new earth. But it says right there in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead small and great standing before God, the books 
were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. I've always found that to be fascinating because you read the book of Revelation and, uh, you know, the book of Revelation, of course, starts out wonderfully in taking us through uh, the different, uh, you know, ages from the, uh, uh, from the apostolic age all the way uh, to our current time. And it's interesting that to every single church, Jesus says to them, not I know your faith. You know, it's interesting because we think of Ephesians chapter 2, which I'm going to read in just a few moments, uh, you know, because, well, let's read it now. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. People think of this text, and it's a powerful text, and there's a powerful truth in it, but we have to understand from a balanced perspective what relationship does works play in our salvation. Many people's answer to that question is works plays no role. We're not saved by our works, therefore works has no importance at all in the relationship uh, of salvation or in our salvational walk with God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10, this is that powerful text which declares to us for by grace you have been saved through faith okay so by grace through faith and not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast and that's a powerful truth praise God that we're not saved by works it goes on to say though for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which is the response of being saved by grace through faith, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So many people say because we're not saved by works and we're saved by grace through faith, well, then works plays no role at all. And it's interesting that uh, you go back to those seven churches. Jesus could have said, you know, I know your faith. I know your faith. I know your faith. I know your faith. But he says each and every time, I know your works. Wait a second, Jesus, if we're not saved by our works and we're saved by grace through faith, then why in the world would you be concerned about our works? Well, that's the question that Mark Finley's asking in this particular lesson here is what relationship does works play in our salvation? We just learned in Ephesians that while we're not saved by our works and we are indeed saved by grace through faith, we are created for good works. And of course, as we read, I think in a previous lesson, we are told in uh, Romans chapter one, verse five, that it is, uh, it is obviously uh, through, through the grace and uh, through the grace that we receive by, by God. It is for obedience that we have received that grace. In other words, the response for the grace that we have been saved by through the faith that we have expressed genuinely in, just, in Christ Jesus, the, the natural results of that, the, the, the testimony that tells the genuineness of that faith is indeed our works. This is exactly what James is expressing in James chapter 2. And I've had some of my brethren in church that have told me before, well, you know, James chapter 2 and Ephesians 2, well, the James contradicts Paul. No, he doesn't. If you read James chapter 2, you'll see he's simply just adding to and further clarifying the relationship of grace and works here. So James chapter 2, we're not going to read it all, but I'm going to start reading in verse 14. And notice what he says here. Uh, this is James 2 beginning in verse 14. He says, what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? In other words, he's simply asking, again, not trying to trash the concept of faith. He's simply saying there's people out there that say, oh, I believe in God. I already have faith in the Lord. I have faith that he's my savior. I have faith that he died for me on the cross. I have faith in what he has done for me. And that's all that I need. And so he says, but if you don't have works, what does it profit you? Can faith save him? Can just your declaration alone or your your, your words that you believe in him, maybe your mental acceptance that Christ indeed is who he says he is and has done what he says he has done. Is that enough to save him? Notice what he goes on to say in verse 15 and onward. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works is dead. In other words, we heard these people a lot of times. Sometimes we, and I'm just going to kind of level with this here for a moment. Sometimes we destroy our witness and therefore the genuineness of our faith really comes forward, whether it's genuine or not genuine. If someone comes to us and says, hey, you know, I, I really need help in this area or this help, or, and it's something we can do, but we say, oh, brothers and sisters, I'll pray for you. You know, the Lord will take care of you. I'll, you're being my prayers. But oftentimes, you know, God has given us the ability to perhaps help our brothers and sisters and put forward in those works to, to show forth the genuineness of the faith that we do have in Jesus Christ. It goes on to say in verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. 
Verse 23 now, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But did Abraham just sim simply make a, a mental accept you know, acceptance of God? Oh, yes, Lord, I know you're speaking to me. I know you've told me you're my God, but that's all I need. No, 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 no. It goes on to say, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that this man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Abraham put forward, he put forward his works that showed the genuineness of his faith and his acceptance of God as the one true God. Verse 25, it says, Likewise was not a, a Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so, you know, people, some people have this mentality that, you know what, I, you, know, do, I, you know, do nothing because Christ has already done it all. You've heard people say this, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do any works because I'm not saved by my works. Christ has done it all for me. That's all I need. And I just need to believe that and accept that. And while that is a major portion, I think of, of our faith and our understanding and who God is and what he has done for us is accepting for sure that we can do nothing in and of ourselves to gain salvation, that we cannot add anything to the work of Christ and the work of the cross and the, the plan of redemption that only Jesus could fulfill. Yes, when we truly believe that and we truly believe in Christ Jesus, the lesson is simply highlighting and emphasizing the fact that each and every one of us, if we say that we are in Christ, we should do something about it, that it plays a healthy role. I remember years ago, I was, uh, I just learned the not just learn, but I've been studying the truth of the Sabbath for many months. And, uh, and I was so excited about this new truth that I'd learned. And I've decided, oh, you know, I to go back to some of my Sunday keeping pastors and ministers and Sunday school teachers. And so I went back to one of my most respected Sunday school teachers in, in the Sunday keeping church. And I remember telling him the story and how, how I, I'd learned this new information about the Sabbath. And I was sharing it with him. And this is a guy I greatly respected, so kind, so calm, so loving all the time. You know, he's just one of those guys you can just go to and talk to and just open up to just a wonderful guy but as I begin to share with him what the Bible teaches about the Sabbath this brother's attitude changed and he responded to me you've got a veil over your eyes you've got a cloak over your eyes depart from me Satan trying to put me under works mm. again the idea that <laughs> I don't have to do anything. You're trying to put me under the law. You're, you're putting me under the works of the law. When in reality, I wasn't communicating that we're saved by the Sabbath, we're saved by works, but that yet because I am saved, I want to keep his commandments because I love him. And of course, this is what the, the lesson brings out. This is our good works empowered by the Holy Spirit does not save us, but they do testify that our faith is genuine. God's final judgment strips away all pretense, all hypocrisy, all falsehood and pierces into the very depth of our being. And I want to finish with this uh, quote here. I don't know if I'll be able to have time to read it all, but this comes from Testimonies for the Church, volume five, page 471 and 472. It says, the fact that the acknowledged, that th the fact that the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead to humility and deep searching of heart on the part of all who profess his name. Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truth will have a most humble opinion of themselves. The more closely they view the spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image and the less they will see of purity or holiness in themselves. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments found not upon our merits, but on his own. Woo. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we go to Pastor John Dinsey, who's going to tell us about a magnificent scene. Thank you so much. Yes, this is Tuesday's portion of the lesson, a magnificent scene. 
And when I started looking at this lesson, I said, you know, there's, there's good material here, but is there something else? It's like I was missing something and I praise the Lord that prayer brought out something that I was really blessed by. So I want to share that with you. Uh, here the lesson begins with the, uh, this thought, the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation are companion volumes. And uh, Daniel was shown a history of the world kingdoms that would appear upon the scene of history and be a kingdom that was controlling other kingdoms. He saw Babylon, Medo Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the breakup of the Roman Empire. He saw these things. The Lord showed these things to him and the 1,260 years depicted in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. But the attention of Daniel is drawn to a scene that is truly magnificent. It can blow your mind as you consider what is taking place here. And I, this is quite, quite a blessing. So we go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, and take this in. Consider what is going on here. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels of burning fire. This is a picture of the ancient of days, God the Father, pure holiness. And we have uh, read in the uh, New Testament that he says that he dwells in light unapproachable, pure holiness of God the Father. Psalms 90 verse 1 and 2 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you have had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This is God the Father that it appears upon the scene and the throne is set in place. In other words, moved to this place. So here, in the book, Great Controversy, 1888 version, uh, page 479, it says, It is He, the source of all being, and the fountain of all law that is to preside in the judgment. And holy angels, as ministers and witnesses, in number 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands attend this great tribunal. How many is that? 10,000 times 10,000. That's one, 100 million, but it said thousands of thousands. This is a magnificent scene, but you know, this, this is a tribunal. This is a judgment that is taking place as we're gonna see in a moment. I have been in courtrooms before and you're sitting there and all of a sudden somebody stands and says, all rise, the Honorable Judge Johnson or whatever his name is, <laughs> is presiding and everybody stands up and there's this silence and this moment of, uh-oh, judgment is about to start. And this is what's taking place here and it is a judgment that is taking place, but we're talking about good news of the judgment. And as you see, it's, it says that the saints possess the kingdom. This is good news that we're talking about here. So, uh, but we're talking, when I was in this courtroom, and I was like, wow, this is the judge, everybody. And you know, people that are, are accused, I don't know what they dressed before, but most of them are dressed, guys, a nice suit and tie there now. And they shave and everything, and the ladies, are, they're dressed very well. They don't come when they're worse, they try to look nice, especially if they're about to be judged, because I don't know what people think is, well, maybe if I dress well, they'll treat me better. I don't know what people are thinking, but in this court scene, it is the angels that are witnesses. We do not appear. This is what they call the pre-advent judgment, the judgment before Jesus returns to the earth. And so Daniel 7 verse 13 says, I was watching in the night visions. This is a vision. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now this is Jesus, the Son of Man, is brought before the Father, the Ancient of Days. What a scene this is. Yeah. But you know, I had to back up and uh, sometimes when I'm praying and studying, uh, when I'm studying and looking at verses and looking here and there, sometimes I say, you know, I had to stand up and walk around a little bit talking with the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, 
uh, sometimes these, uh, the Lord is like, He opens this window. Yes, yes. And I want to tell you, this is, this is the book of Daniel we're reading. The book of what? The book of Daniel is not the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, when, when the book of Revelation takes place, Jesus had already come to this earth. Jesus had already faced temptation, tried every single day by the devil. He wasn't just three. Every single day the devil was after him, but he was victorious. He uh, was tempted at all points and he was victorious. And let's go ahead and read that here in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our, our confession. Let us hold fast, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. Notice, Karen, notice here. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Mercy. Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is good news. So what Daniel saw was something that was going to take place in the future. He was privileged to see the Son of Man. This is a picture of Jesus after facing temptation, after being victorious. He is there. He has the right to be there. Mm -hmm. He is worthy to be there before the Father mm -hmm. to present the cases and present us. Because you see, the Bible reveals to us that Jesus is our advocate. First John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, uh, these things I write unto you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Daniel is seeing Jesus in this condition, that he has been our propitiation for our sins. He has been the Lamb of God that was slain and died on the cross. He is there, worthy to be there. He is worthy. And then you'll, you'll find out in a moment, Revelation chapter 5, you're going to hear about that, that uh, the Lamb is worthy. Mm -hmm. Worthy is the Lamb. That beautiful song in the Hallelujah chor Chorus that says, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. I don't know if you heard that song before, but it's, it's magnificent. And this is a magnificent scene that we're seeing here. And Daniel was able to see this. I don't know if he, he took in all that he was watching because it's really magnificent. This is our Savior, Jesus Christ, appearing before the Father to represent you and me. And so, my little children, uh, as it says here, he's writing these things so that you may not sin. We have to fear God and keep His commandments. We have to uh, fear God and uh, glorify Him because the hour of His judgment is come. I want to read this to you from The Great Controversy, page 489, because this is important, important to know. This it says, The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was His death upon the cross. Amen. By His death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. There the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice of made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne and through His mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to Him in faith may be presented before God. And this is what we're seeing here. This is what Daniel was seeing. What a privilege. He saw all the way into the year 1844 when Jesus Christ and the Father go from the holy place to the most holy place and judgment began in the year 1844. You're going to hear more about that as we continue in these lessons. We need to uh, pay close attention to what we are studying here because eyes are going to be open and we're going to realize that we have a wonderful God, a wonderful Savior who loved us enough to die for us and willing to represent me, you, before the Father and say, I died for him. Yes. Mm -hmm. He has asked for forgiveness of his sins. Mm -hmm. And I 
claim him as my child. Mm. This is a marvelous thing to consider. This is what Daniel is seeing. Uh, wow, we, our time is gone. But con consider the great mercy of God and the great love of God. Here is a magnificent scene. Continue to look into it because there are wonderful things to see here. Amen and amen. What a powerful, beautiful message that we have. Thank you, amen. John, for sharing that. And Ryan and Shelley. My name is James Rafferty and I have Wednesday's lesson and it is entitled A Glimpse of Heaven and we're going to move right into Revelation chapter 4. The quarterly takes us to Revelation chapter 4 where John beholds an open door in heaven and receives an invitation. Come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. Revelation 4 verse 1. So Jesus invited the apostle to look through this open door into heaven's sanctuary to view eternal scenes in the great controversy between good and evil. The quarterly goes on to say, we too can look through that open door. With John and Johnny, we can look through that open door. I love that. God gives us these glimpses, right? He gives us these, these visions, if you will, as we, as we wrestle with Him, as we pray with Him, as we walk with Him, as we talk with Him. God opens our minds. And that's what He was doing with John on the Isle of Patmos. That's what He was doing with, with Johnny this last week. And we too can receive a glimpse of the eternal plan of salvation. And that's what we're about to witness the quarterly goes on to say right here in Revelation chapter 4. Now when we read Revelation chapter 4, 2 through 4, we see some similarities between the judgment scene in Revelation chapter, or excuse me, in Daniel chapter 7. Um, the quarterly goes on to say, however, there are some differences. Uh, there are elders there, but there are no books. There's no elders in, Re in Daniel 7. In fact, what's really interesting is every scene, throne scene in the Bible is minus the elders. In Daniel chapter 7, in Ezekiel chapter 1, in Isaiah chapter 6, you have a lot of similarities in all of these chapters. The throne room scene is there. The, the, the angelic beings, four angelic beings are there singing holy, 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 but there are no elders. So this is an incredible vision, an incredible picture into the plan of salvation because guess what? Post Christ's resurrection, as we enter into this, this new prophetic cycle in Revelation chapter, uh, chapters 4 and 5, the seven seals, we're going to actually see what the slain lamb has accomplished. He has enabled there to be elders in heaven. Now, who are these elders? That's the question that the quarterly asks, and we'll get to that in just a second. So there's no judgment, uh, judgment set. There's no books opened in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Actually, there is a book in Revelation 5. Jill's going to share that with us. That book, though, is sealed. So a little bit different scenario here. We're getting an introduction here to something amazing. Uh, this, this glimpse into heaven is going to show us a picture of God's grace. How? Well, the throne room scene, we have God the Father sitting, the quarterly goes on to say, surrounded by the heavenly beings. There's thunder and lightning, um, which also is indicative of His presence. But then it says in Revelation 4 verse 4 that there are 24 elders present around God's throne. Who are these elders, the quarterly asked. Well, in ancient Israel, there were 24 divisions in the Levitical priesthood. And these priests represented the people before God. So they had these 24 divisions among the Levitical priesthood and they would go in in their course and they would represent the people before God. They would take a little break, right? They'd take a little vacation, go on a little cruise, take a little downtime, write a book, whatever, right? And another, you know, a priest would come in and he, they would follow through with the course. And, and that's the way they shared the work work of interceding and mediating for God's people. These priests represented people before God. In 1 Peter 2, 9, the apostle declares that in the New Testament, believers are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So the 24 elders represent, reading the quarterly here, all the, re the, the redeemed that one day will rejoice around the throne of God. They represent the people resurrected at Christ's resurrection and who ascended to heaven with Him. Matthew 27, verse 52, and Ephesians 4, 7, and 8 are the references given here in the quarterly. Now, this is good news. There are redeemed people from this earth around the throne in heaven. That's incredible when you think about it. And what's, what's especially uh, interesting here is that these redeemed elders, and by the way, that word elder is 
always ever used for a human being in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's never used for an angel. It's never used for any other kind of being. You know, in, in uh, Job chapter one, the sons of God come before the Lord to present themselves. And they're different from these elders. The word elder is specifically used for humans and of course, for these redeemed beings who are around the throne and they have white robes promised to the churches mm -hmm. who overcome. They have crowns promised to the churches who overcome. They are sitting on thrones promised to the churches, specifically the church of Laodicea. Him, to him that overcome, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Well, this is a foretaste, an earnest of that, if you will. Christ resurrected with him, took captivity captive with him to heaven, and he gave to them a taste of what God has promised to every one of us who overcome mm -hmm. by the blood of the Lamb by the word of our testimony and love not our lives under the death. So they're clothed with white robes that, that signifies the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about righteousness, it simply means the right doing of Jesus, the right doing of his life and the right doing in his death. He did everything right. We do everything wrong. He did everything right. And so he gives us everything he did right. And he takes everything we did wrong in our place when we put our trust, our faith, when we accept him as our savior. They have a golden crown upon their head, signifying that they are victorious in the battle with evil. They are part of heaven's royal line of faith filled believers. So they sit on these thrones and it, it's just directing us to this beautiful promise that God has given us that him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne even as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Yeah. So we see this picture in Revelation chapter four. We're, we're stepping into a glimpse of, of what God has promised to all of those who put their faith in Jesus. Now, we see this more clearly as we read a little verse. I'm gonna steal a little verse from Jill in Revelation chapter five, if you don't mind. Okay, Revelation chapter five. Let's just move down here in Revelation chapter five. After we see the lamb, Jesus Christ symbolized here, slain from the foundation of the world. After we see the lamb, it says here in Revelation chapter five, verse eight, and when he, the lamb had taken the book, the, the seal book, the four beasts and the four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy, verse nine, to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and here's the key phrase, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And verse 10, has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So these two verses are directing us to understand more fully who these 24 elders are. And what God is saying to us basically is, I have included you in my throne room. Mm -hmm. uh, you are part of heaven's council. You are replacing, in a sense, those fallen angels. When we look at Revelation uh, 4 and we compare it with, with Isaiah 6 and we compare it with Revel or Daniel chapter 7 and, and Ezekiel, we, we have to think about the fact that the angels are always present. The angels are always present in all of these scenes. But we know, according to Revelation chapter 12, that there was a war that started in heaven. Sin didn't start on planet Earth, it started in heaven. And in that war, a third part of the angels were deceived. And they fell, they were cast out of heaven with Lucifer, with Satan, the devil, their leader in rebellion. But did you know that mankind is actually, redeemed mankind is actually going to replace those fallen angels. Jesus says that in heaven, there's gonna be neither marrying nor giving in marriage, but we are gonna be like the angels. That we are going to be, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter two, it says that we were made a little while lower than the angels, that we are going to be actually be taking the place of the angels in God's heavenly throne room. That we're gonna be participating with the angels in that anthem through all eternity, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, that we are gonna be part of that grand, well, in Revelation chapter four, I mean, excuse me, Revela yeah, Revelation chapter four, it says in verse eight, and the four beasts and, and with each of them, each of them having six wings, full of eyes within and without, rest not day or night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In Revelation chapter five, as we continued reading there, the angels are around the throne and the four beasts and the 24 elders, thousand times 10,000s and thousands of thousands, and they say with a loud voice, mm -hmm. 
worthy is the lamb that was slain. All of heaven is breaking out in song and holy anthem to God, and we're going to be part of that group. Now, right now, in church, when they have the music, the hymns or the music, I don't sing with a loud voice. I let the people around me, you know, I let them drown my voice out. I like to sing, and the louder the voices are around me, the louder I sing. The softer the voices are around me, the softer I sing. But someday, I'm going to have a voice that can be loud and heard and in tune, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and this is the picture that God has for us. It's a beautiful glimpse of heaven. And with this picture behind us, we can stand, we can step into the, to the judgment with boldness. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, each one of you. What an incredible study. Pastor James, that was a beautiful setup. Thank you. I love to hear you break down the book of Revelation specifically. Great Thank job. you. Revelation 4, of course, that throne room description. I'm Jill Morricone. I forgot to say my name. And we are on Thursday's lesson, which is Jesus is Worthy. We're looking at Revelation chapter 5. So we have been reading Revelation 4 and 5, but Revelation chapter 5 is a specific moment in salvation history. This is specifically AD 31, right after the ascension of Jesus, when he is there in heaven. You know, Acts 1, 9 through 11, gives us the ascension of Jesus from an earthly perspective. Mm -hmm. We see what the disciples saw. We see as Jesus was taken from them up into heaven. But Revelation chapter five kind of pulls the curtain back mm -hmm. and we see what took place in heaven at that moment. We see Christ's enthronement and inauguration into his ministry as our king and priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Before we get to the six takeaways from Revelation chapter five, before we go there, I wanna give just a little bit of history. In the Old Testament, the Israelite kings were required at their enthronement to provide for themselves a scroll of the law, the covenant scroll to read and to obey. Later Israelite history, you look at say King Joash, the scroll was presented to the newly crowned king mm -hmm. as the royal emblem. The newly crowned king would take the scroll, sit on the throne and begin his reign. In this role, the Israelite king was the covenant mediator. He was the guardian of God's law there in the land. When Christ took the scroll, we're going to discover that in Revelation chapter 5, and was seated at the right hand of God, you see that in Psalm 110, he became the rightful king of the earth. What was lost through Adam was now regained. All authority and sovereignty is given to Christ. Fallen human beings, that's you and I, are now given access to God through the blood of the Lamb. Jesus became our high priest, our mediator, our advocate there in heaven. And we'll discover that the Holy Spirit went from being present there in the th throne room to being disseminated throughout the earth, which you can find at Pentecost in Acts chapter two. So let's look at our six takeaways. We're in Revelation five. We'll pick it up in verse one. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, ancient scrolls were often sealed. Why? To protect a document from being tampered with. And the document could only be opened or the seals only broken by the authorized person. It's interesting that the scroll is written on the inside and on the outside. We see this comparison in Ezekiel. You can read that, Ezekiel chapter two and three, where the scroll is written on the inside and on the outside. And in Ezekiel two, verse 10, it talks about this scroll. And it says, he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside. Written on it were, what are those words? Lamentations and mourning and woe. So the question is, what is this sealed scroll? The scroll that's sealed with the seven seals. It is the record of human history the record of lamentation, mourning and woe. And why is the human history, why is the record mourning and woe? 
because we're under the condemnation of sin. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us deserve to die. And yet Jesus, the Lamb of God, showed up. He is the one. Our destiny was sealed. We were under the condemnation and the curse of the law. But Jesus shows up because he can change that. He can open the scroll because of the blood of the lamb and he can save us. He can change our destiny. Let's keep reading. We're in verse two. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy? Who can open the scroll and loose its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Whose blood can cover our sins? Whose grace can give us power to live without sin? Who is gonna be the mediator between us and God? Takeaway number one, when all seems hopeless, your redemption is ready to come. Your trial, what you're going through is not the end. When it seems like there's no help and who is worthy, all these angels and the 24 elders and everyone in heaven, who is worthy, who can do it? When it seems all is hopeless, redemption is ready to come. Verse five, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah being a messianic title of the root of David. Jesus coming from the line of David. Christ came from that line, just like the Old Testament kings who had authority to rule and become the covenant mediator. Jesus came as our Messiah. Takeaway number two, Jesus is worthy. Jesus conquered death. He lived a perfect life. He died as my substitute. Mm -hmm. He fulfilled the claims of the law. He took my punishment so that I could go free. He resurrected and ascended to the place of the right hand of the Father. That's what we see here in Revelation chapter five. He's ready to take on that high priestly role as our mediator. Verse six, we're back in Revelation five, verse six. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Wait a minute, I thought it was a lion, mm. right? Mm. I heard it was a lion. Behold, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that's who's gonna open the scroll. So John's looking, where's the lion? Where's the lion? I'm gonna be scared, where's the lion? Wait, a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now it's interesting to me, this word lamb in Greek, you all can correct me, but I think it means a little lamb, yes. not just a lamb, but a little lamb. This is used 28 times in Revelation to refer to the crucified, risen, and glorified Christ. This is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Takeaway number three, God reveals himself to you and me in ways that we can understand and we can embrace. You know, I love that because John's looking and I would have been terrified if I were there and see the lion of the tribe of Judah, but no, he sees the lamb. God reveals himself to us in ways we can understand and embrace. Verse seven, then he came, this is Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God. He came to take the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is the inauguration of Jesus' high priestly ministry. Judgment and authority have been assigned to Christ. We read verse eight. Verse eight, they begin to worship and all bowed down before the lamb. Takeaway number four, recognize the authority of the lamb in your life. 
Heaven surely did. They're not saying, I'm not sure I'm going to surrender to this. I'm not sure I'm going to bow down. No, recognize the authority mm -hmm. of the Lamb in your life. Verse 9, they sang the new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and peoples and nation. You know, Revelation 4, worship, uh, worship occurs because of creation. Mm. God is the creator. Mm -hmm. Revelation 5, mm. worship occurs because of redemption. Mm. Jesus, the lamb, is our redeemer. Takeaway number five, Jesus' death reunites you and I with the Father. Sin bridged a great gulf between us and God. But because of Jesus' death, we do not have to be afraid of the coming judgment. Revelation 5, verse 9, last verse. And have made us, this is continuing the anthem of praise. Verse 10. Uh, thank you. Have made us kings and priests, thank you, to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Takeaway number six, Jesus' death changes our status. Mm -hmm. We're no longer sinners. We're no longer cowering in fear. We are forgiven, saved, transformed by his grace. In fact, we have the privilege of becoming kings and priests. I'm so grateful that Jesus mm -hmm. is worthy. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 What a beautiful study, each and every one of you. We have just a moment. Would you like to sure. make a closing comment? Sure. Jesus says repeatedly to us, He knows our works. And I just want to ask you, my friends, um, what testimony does your works tell about your faith? Mm -hmm. Amen. There, there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, it says, the books are open, but Jesus Christ it, when you get to verse 14, He is given dominion and power. It has an everlasting kingdom, and you can be a part of that kingdom. Amen. Revelation 4 gives us a glimpse into heaven, and what do we see there? We see 24 elders redeemed by the blood of the Lamb who has prevailed where we have failed. Amen. I love the fact that judgment is given in favor of the saints. What an incredible promise in these last days. Amen. And you know, God is righteous. His whole purpose of righteousness by faith is to recreate His image in us. So it is important. He's going to restore His righteousness in us. Well, you've heard the good news of the judgment. We want you to join us next week. We will be studying the hour of His judgment. We love you and we thank you for studying with us. Bye-bye.